17 and all your dreams are knocking on your front door. I want to cry now thinking about how much I didn't like myself. We're not alone at all. None of us are alone. 25, you realize that nothing is the same as before. I wish I could bottle this feeling up and share it with people. Where did we go? Where did we go? Where did we go? All of those years. I'm expected to stay at home and take care of everybody. How did we end up? How did we end up? How did we end up here? I thought, I'm never going to see my kids again. And this is how their mother is going to die. Is it all, oh, all a lie? Hi, beautiful people. I'm Rachel Severs, and you're listening to Consent to Treat. Hi, beautiful people. Welcome back to season three. This is Rachel Severs, life coach, counselor, and today we're learning about me. For all of you who are interested in knowing a little bit more about me and why the hell you should be listening to me, this is the episode for you. It's funny because I have a hard time believing anyone would want to like sit down and actually listen to stuff about me when that's what I do all day, every day. And I've never heard a story from a person that I didn't think was the most fascinating thing ever. But yet when it comes to me talking about myself, I why do you care? Why do you care that I was born in Grand Island, Nebraska, and that my sperm donor left my mom when she was pregnant with me, and then she married a grandiose narcissist, and I was raised by him? Why do you care about that? So today I'll be going over the things that when I look at my life, I'll give you kind of like the title of each chapter and the synopsis of each chapter. Chapter one being my biological father left when my mom was pregnant with me. And I was an oops. I was eight years after the last sibling. Okay. So I have my brother, my sister, and my other sister. And then eight years later, whoops, there was me. So I was born into a situation where I wasn't wanted. And I don't mean that as like poor me, but it it was genuinely my biological dad left. He never turned back. He never wanted to have anything to do with me. My mom didn't plan for me. She was stressed out to have me. It was just that environment. Then my mom married a grandiose narcissist, super on the attack, emotionally, verbally, mind fucking me every day, physically abusing me. And that's who raised me from two years old. I grew up in a Lutheran environment. I grew up in a codependent family. My mom has no recollection of me as a baby. (laughs) So I had to ask my sister, who was really the one who took care of me when I was a baby. I look back at my, especially my early years, and I know that I was a very frightened kid. Because when you have a mom who isn't protecting you and a dad who's just attacking you constantly, you're pretty scared. So I learned how to be a people pleaser. What do they want from me? What's going to keep me safe here? You know, like, what do I need to say? What chores do I need to do? What work do I need to do just to be safe, really? So people describe me as really well-mannered, always in a good mood such a good girl. (laughs) I was such a hard worker, all these things, right? But it was all out of fear. I've always gravitated to a leadership role in high school. I was ASB spirit commissioner, class president, school president by my senior year, prom queen, theater, whatever you want to call them. I I was like just always gravitating toward the leadership position. And to this day, that's where I'm really comfortable. I get bored if I'm following instructions. I want to be like creating the instructions. (laughs) And that's just me. And I spend a healthy amount of time being embarrassed about that or trying to change that or don't be such I'm using air quotes, bossy person and all that shit. But at this point, I just recognize that, you know what? This is who I've always been. This is who I am today. I never mean ill will. I always want to use it for good. So fuck it. That's just who I am. I've been married three times. The first time was a codependent disaster. Poor guy. I had no idea who I was. 
I went to a Lutheran college where the goal in life there apparently is to find your Lutheran spouse and then give birth to four Lutheran babies. Ugh. But I did it. You know, I found my spouse, got married, no idea who I was, no idea what the real meaning of love was, cheated on him, promptly got divorced, quickly got into a new relationship with my daughter's dad. When I got pregnant with Noe, my daughter, I was so worried. I had a mother that didn't hug. Didn't, she never read stories to me. It was always like, go away, go away, go away, go away. I was so scared that I would do the same to my own daughter. So I read books on how to be a parent. I had never babysat babies. I'd never held babies. I didn't know what the hell to do with baby. So when I gave birth to Noe and they put her on my chest, my heart suddenly just exploded open. And I just remember saying over and over again, she's so beautiful. She's so beautiful. She's so, like, I couldn't believe how beautiful she was. And I don't think I had ever seen anything as that beautiful before. I traveled the world, but yet this little baby was just perfection. She was the whole universe. I'd never felt that before. No one had ever felt that about me before. I'd never experienced that before and I'd never felt it from within before. So when I experienced that, it was like, oh, thank God I have it in me to explode with love and awe for another person. And I don't think I've ever felt that about any one ever since. It was about a year later that I had to start exploring, how am I able to love this person? How am I able to touch her and hold her and just to rock her and look at her in her eyes and read to her? And I quit my job. I, I did everything. I just stayed with her. I was just, I just wanted to be with her all the time. Nothing was more important to me. Noe is inquisitive. She's thoughtful. She's pensive. She's careful. She's becoming the most beautiful little woman. And I love her. So with my daughter's dad, that relationship didn't work out. Then pretty quickly again, got married to my ex-wife. That didn't work out. So lots of looking at myself. What's my issues here? You know, but I, I love my story because each relationship was so different and each relationship brought up parts of me that were not healed or parts of me that hadn't grown yet or needed some refinement. So they all gave me opportunities to learn, grow, figure things out. Let's talk about my gayness, shall we? Maybe you heard me mention that W-I-F-E word, wife. I've had one. I'm going to be honest. I needed a little prompting about this because from my perspective, it doesn't even occur to me that this might be an interesting thing or that people might have questions about this because I met someone, I got to know someone and I fell in love with this person and I agreed to marry her and we did the marriage thing and it didn't work out for whatever reasons. Okay. And to me, it, it's just the, the act of falling in love with a person and doing all the things that love makes you want to do with the person. But what I'm learning is for people who have never experienced bisexuality or homosexuality or there might be some questions about that. How do you fall in love with and be sexually attracted to a man? How do you fall in love with and be sexually attracted to a woman? Are you straight? Are you gay? Are you bisexual? What's the label? You know, people have a lot of questions about this. How does scissoring work? Doesn't. Scissoring doesn't work. It's not really a thing. I also hate being defined by my marriages too. So I was deep in the throes of people pleasing, codependency, which just basically means like, I don't know myself and I don't know if I'm good or not. 
unless the people around me are telling me that I'm good or telling me I'm okay, or I needed people around me even to like tell me who I am. I did that super depressed, super anxious, cheated on my husband because I needed affirmation. You know, it was just, for me, it feels gross talking about it. Like, ugh, yuck. That's where I was then. Until about 27, 28, which is when I got in my master's program, I knew I was going to cheat on my husband. So I started going to therapy and I told her, dude, I think I'm going to cheat on my husband. She's like, no, you're not. If you're here talking about it, you're not going to cheat on him. And I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure I'm going to cheat on him. She's like, I'm not concerned about you. And the next week I came back and I'm like, yeah, I cheated on him. See? But when I went to therapy, I saw this person listening to me, talking to me in her cute little office. And all I could keep thinking is, wow, she's got like the dream job. I want to do that. So pretty shortly after I, you know, kind of recovered from the whole divorce thing, I got into my master's program because I wanted to do what she was doing. And I did my residency after that, took my test, failed it. (laughs) Then I studied for it, passed it, immediately opened my own private practice, literally can count on one hand the days of work that I have not enjoyed. I've worked really, really, really hard to recover and to grow. I've had to learn about codependency. I've had to learn about attachment issues. I've had to learn about narcissism. I've had to learn about depression, anxiety, uh, mindfulness. It wasn't just going to school and learning these things for my clients. It was going to school and learning them for myself. Going to therapy every week, every two weeks, once a month, how, however much I could afford, you know, doing the work for me and for the clients that I was going to have one day. I enjoy every fucking day of work. I have the best job ever, and nobody can convince me otherwise. When COVID happened, I had to move my practice 100% online. And that really pushed me into a place of depression, first of all, realizing that the connection that I have with my clients feeds me more than I ever knew. And the Board of Behavioral Sciences would say, your your clients are not supposed to feed you. You're supposed to feed your clients only. And if you need to regulate all of that and there's no self-disclosure, you're not, they're not supposed to know about you and blah, blah, blah. Okay, fuck that. At the end of the day, the most effective therapy and counseling that I've experienced has been an exchange between two people. Now, don't get me wrong. It's, there's parameters around it and there's boundaries around it. But it's not a one-sided thing. I'm going to just say it for all the therapists and counselors out there. We get fed from what we do. There, I said it. Everything in me is like screaming, no, you're not supposed to say that. Because I'm telling you, in the therapy world, therapists are not supposed to disclose anything about themselves. There's supposed to be walls up between you and your clients you're not supposed to feel anything. You're not supposed to have an experience with your clients. It's all about the client having their thing and you are the safe place that they do that with. Okay. I can see the validity in most of that, but it just turns out that that's not my style. It's not how I work. And I get the best results when I work the way that I work. And going online pushed me so far to the the therapy world end of it where this is cold. This is you just talking. I'm just listening. There's really not a lot of interaction happening between us, which is what, I mean, if we take it to the extreme end of things, that's what psychotherapy is all about, right? Really made me question, what the hell am I doing? I want to be doing more. Not only do I want to be back in my office, but I want to be in a park with my clients. I want to be in their home. I want to be wherever I can be most effective with them. If talking to them about my experience as a parent helps them, I want to be able to do that. And you can't do that as a therapist. I want to do these things. I'm good at these things. I get results with these things. And so last year, 
I retired my license so that I can do these things. The results are tremendous. (laughs) Business has never been better. Clients are progressing. The connection with clients is great. My job satisfaction is even better. Just another example of wherever that fire is taking you, that's where you're supposed to go. So scary. You know, and the world looks at you. What? You work so hard to get this license and to be licensed with the state of California. And you can be on insurance panels and take Blue Cross and take Blue Shield and blah, blah, blah. Why would you give that up? (laughs) Fuck it. Because I'm more than that. I'm not saying it wasn't scary for me. Hoping that I'll still be able to pay my bills. Hoping that it'll work out hoping that people will still believe in me, but here I am. And so now I get to do things like create my own wellness retreat, do my own podcast, run my own private practice, retire my license. I get to do it however I want because that's my personality. I see it. I want it. I go get it. In October of last year. So we're looking at about 11 months ago that I launched my professional work on Instagram and Facebook. And that has been, you know, very successful. Now, however, every professional consultation I've had about the podcast or about my professional work, everyone has said, you're going to have to get on TikTok. You got to be on TikTok, babe. Got to be on there. Well, the other night, you know, I had a couple hours to spare. I was laying in bed and I was like, you know what? I'm going to start a TikTok account. You know, I've got lots of videos that I put on Instagram. I could just start putting my videos on TikTok too. Honestly, I didn't know how TikTok worked. I honestly wanted to see if I put a video on TikTok, will it even play? (laughs) Do do they play the same on TikTok? I don't know. So I put a video on there. The next day I put another video on there and it had 60,000 views by the time I woke up. The audience on TikTok is vocal brave, critical, downright mean sometimes. (laughs) It was pretty fucking scary to get so many negative comments because people on Facebook and, and Instagram, they don't, they don't talk to you like that. I mean, that hasn't been my experience so far. So me and my manager, producer, editor, my everything, me, me and my everything, Elodie, we sat down And we had to come up with a game plan. You know, getting a thousand critical comments directed at you in one day, that's a lot. I don't think any one human being can digest all of that in a healthy way. That's just a lot of negativity. It's crazy. And it's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's what we've been working for, you know? So very exciting. We have a lot more in store there. And now we get to start integrating our podcast stuff into our TikTok feed. And that's really exciting to me. We have spent two seasons listening to other people's stories. Now I've given you a bit of my own story so that you can kind of hear who's behind the mic and who it is that's talking to you and who it is that's talking to all these clients. Now let's get back to the way things should be. Let's focus back on the clients again. That's the way I like it. If you have more questions for me, let me know. I don't know what you guys want to know about me. So if you want to know something about me, let me know. I'll probably tell you. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and now TikTok at Rachel Severs MS. This has been Consent to Treat. Thank you for listening and supporting beautiful people. Bye-bye.